That was good. You know who created music, don't you? The Lord God did. Amen. To worship God. That's beautiful. Have your Bible turn to Genesis 5 with me this morning, please. Get that in one hand and Matthew 1 in the other. Genesis 5, verse 1. In the Gospel of Levi, Matthew the publican, chapter number 1, verse 1. The first man and the tax collector. Genesis 5, verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam, in the day when they were created. Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Father, I pray that you'd add the blessing to your word, blessed to the hearts of the people. Open up our soul tonight as the Bereans, Father, to search the scriptures, more noble than all the rest, because they went to your word to see if these things be so. In thy holy name I pray, amen. amen. The book of Genesis is the book of beginnings. Bereshit in Hebrew means the book of beginnings. So many things began in the book of Genesis. The first time the term Genesis 5 verse 1 shows up in your Bible, this is the book of of the generations of Adam. The first time that it shows up in the New Testament and the last time that it shows up in the Bible and only the second time that it shows up in the Bible is in Matthew chapter number one, verse one, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. It's very important to understand the connection between the two. Here in Genesis chapter number five, we find the book of the generation of Adam. Adam had children before that but they're not called part of his generation. They're not included in the generations of Adam. There's a lot of controversy about what's going on with Cain and all of that. We'll get into that tonight. But the bottom line is this. The first time in your Bible that the scripture says the book of the generation of anybody is in Genesis 5 and the one born is Seth. And if you'll notice that it says specifically that he had one in his own image. Seth was born in the image of Adam. Adam was made in the image of God. But Adam sinned against God and that image was tainted from that day on until the Lord Jesus Christ showed up who is the express image of God. No man walking the face of this earth ever bore that image of God in its purity and its clarity. But the Lord Jesus Christ, when he came, restored the lost image that the first man lost. Now note carefully, Matthew chapter number one and verse number one. Matthew chapter number one and verse number one. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ. Now that's only the second time in the whole Bible that that's mentioned, although there are 14 generations found in the scripture. That's two times seven, and lo and behold, the 14th generation recorded in the Holy Bible is in Matthew chapter number one and verse number one. That is two times seven divine completion. And lo and behold, guess who it would be? It would be our Lord Jesus Christ. The fulfillment and completion of divine completion and perfection, it can't get any better than that. The next number as far as God's concerned to follow seven is eight, and that number is the number of our Lord Jesus Christ. The gematria of his name is eight, eight, eight. And anyone he has anything to do with will always have a new beginning, new beginning, new beginning. Our Lord Jesus Christ raised from the dead. There's something else about this that's so very important. And that is that the first man, Adam, was of the earth, earthy. The last Adam is the Lord from heaven. The Lord Jesus Christ is called two unique terms that no one else is in all the Bible. He's called the second man, last Adam. Note carefully, this is why the book of the generation of the first Adam, Matthew, Genesis 5. The book of the generation of the last Adam, Matthew 1. The book of the generation of the first man, Genesis chapter number 5. The book of the generation of the second man, Matthew chapter number 1. All the men that lived from the first man to the second man were cursed unto the first man. And God considered every man that was born of the first man, Romans chapter 5, whereas by one man death entered the world and death by sin. So death has passed upon all men. 
The first man, Adam, was created by God. He was created, by, he was literally a son of God. A, I said, folks, not the. He was a son of God because God was his father. He was his creator. So he was the first man. And therefore, his genealogy is said, the book of the generations of Adam. The Lord Jesus Christ is the second man. Second man, therefore his genealogy is the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. God's calling your attention to something that's very important. For in, Matthew, in, in Genesis chapter number five, and all that followed him are part of the generation of the first Adam. But in Matthew chapter number one, verse number one, this is the second man, last Adam. All that follow there are following from this generation. The last one, the 14th, the completion of divine perfection. I am, thank God, so glad that we find in Matthew chapter number one and verse number one, as we read these genealogies, something profound begins to jump off of the pages of this book. You say, what is that, preacher? We find in Matthew chapter number one and verse number one, Four women mentioned in his genealogy. Now, any self-respecting Jew 2,000 years ago would have had a problem with somebody listing a genealogy with a woman in it. You say, well, a bunch of misogynists are they then? Listen, we're talking about 2,000 years ago. We're talking about the culture of a people far removed from us today. And therefore, the genealogy was counted through the man and the man's names, men's names are listed, but lo and behold, four women show up in Matthew chapter number uh, one. And these women are Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, and Bathsheba. These four women, each one, have a peculiar place in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ. But here is what is so important about it. The first genealogy in Genesis chapter number five and verse number one is the genealogy of mankind. It is mankind coming upon the face of the earth. Nothing particular associated with it except the fact that this is the genealogy that God will bring the Savior from because he had to be a son of, of Adam through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But the genealogy of Matthew chapter number one, all the way down through that first chapter, is a remarkable genealogy in this sense. The people that show up in that genealogy don't deserve to be there. <laughs> when you begin to look at that and you begin to consider the lives of these people, you think to yourself, what are they doing in the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ? And the only word that can describe that is grace, grace, grace. In the book of Zechariah, it says that they'll come and build that second temple. And when they come and build that second temple, the temple of the Lord Jesus, when he comes back with his kingdom, the Bible says they'll lay the headstone and they'll be crying, grace, 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 hallelujah. In other words, the house of the Lord is a house of grace. It is built upon a foundation of grace. The walls are erected in grace. It's sealed with grace. It's paved with grace. It is grace, my friend, that got you into the genealogy of Christ. It is grace that called you by your name when you did not know God. It was grace that convicted you of your sins and brought you to a loving Savior. It is the grace of God that bringeth salvation, that hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, it is the grace of God. And without grace, my dear friends, there is no salvation. Grace, what a marvelous thing. Grace, the grace of God. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Tamar had been promised a husband. She had two that died. Had one husband died, his brother died. And so Judah said, I'll wait until this one grows up and you can have him. But Judah said, I've lost all the boys I'm losing to this girl. <laughs> And so he, he dealt with her in trickery and deceit. And so my friend, when, Harry, when, Harry, when Judah's son did grow up and Tamar realized that he was not going to be her husband, then my friend, she, she did something on her own. She took off the robes of a widow, stood by the roadside and dressed as a harlot. And this high upstanding moral Judah went in unto his own daughter-in-law, but he didn't know that was his daughter-in-law. He went into her and she got pregnant and she kept as a signet. She kept as a promissory note from him till he could come up with the money. She kept three items that belonged to Judah. And then later on, about three months later, word came to Judah 
that his daughter-in-law Tamar had been, had, had been playing the whoredoms, had been playing the whore. And so Judah rose up in his righteous indignation as the head of his tribe, of all the people that stood around him, respecting him for his great message, his great lifestyle, his great word, his great testimony. And he said, bring her forth and let her be burnt. Amen, brother. Yeah, amen. Hypocrisy, my friend, goes a long way back. It does. It goes a long way back. But you see, Tamar was smarter than Judah. A whole lot smarter than Judah. Because she had these artifacts that belonged to Judah. And he knew they did. And so when she was brought forth to be burnt, she says, By the man that owns these am I with child. And Judah remembered and recognized what was it. And he confessed, She's more righteous than I. Take her away. Don't burn her. I'm guilty of what I did. But that Bible says in the book of Revelation chapter number 5 and verse number 5 that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Lion of the tribe of Judah and he hath prevailed. Amen. It is not my friend the ability or the place or the power of any of us. It is the power of God by grace that saves every last one of us. We're simply instruments in the hands of God. We're ministers of the New Testament. But my friend, I am not the New Testament. It is the book that I preach and the gospel that we preach and the power that is in this gospel. And so it goes. We, he, we know the story of Rahab. I preached about her this morning. She was a prostitute on the wall of Jericho, but she had heard how the God of the Jews, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had overcome every God that had come before them and had made his people free from 400 years of Egyptian bondage. She winds up as the great, 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 great grandmother of David the king. You read about her in the book of Ruth. She was a Moabitess. And my, or Rahab, she, my Rahab jumped ahead of myself. Rahab was a prostitute. And so the Bible says that when they came into the city of Jericho that she tied a scarlet cord in the window and when she tied that scarlet, scarlet cord in the window they passed her over and let her household live. Have you got a cord in your window? Hallelujah to God. You say preacher, what in the world does the Lord want with a prostitute in his genealogy? Grace folks, amen. He's trying to get a message across in Matthew chapter number one that this is a king and he's the son of Abraham and he's the son of David, but he's a king of a kingdom unlike any other kingdom that's ever been on the face of the earth. And that's what it's about. There's two of those kingdoms in the world. One is the kingdom of heaven and the other the kingdom of God. Then we come to Ruth the Moabitess that I jumped ahead of a moment ago. She was born into an accursed tribe, not one of the tribes of Israel. You know where Moab and Ammon came from as they as they fled out of, out, of, uh, out of Sodom and Gomorrah and they had incest with their father and the two tribes were born, the two uh, families were Moab and Ammon. And so therefore to be a Moabite was to be called God's wash pot. And a Moabite would not enter into the congregation of the children of Israel. And yet by grace, she said unto Naomi, before she went back to Bethlehem, she said, your God is my God, your people are my people. Where thou lodgest, I will lodge. I will be with you till you die, and where you die, I'll die. I choose to become one of you. That's one of the good things about the Old Testament Israel. And that is that if somebody wanted to come in by choice, if they chose to come in and become part of those people, they would let them come in. That is a good thing. That is a good thing. And so Ruth went back with Naomi and they went back to Bethlehem. And the, you know the story of the book of Ruth. It's a beautiful story. How that they fed, their hap was to fall upon the lot of the field that belonged to Boaz. And Boaz left her handfuls on purpose. Amen. I've been eating handfuls on purpose a long time, folks. God has blessed me many times with handfuls on purpose that you don't deserve. Hey, folks, have you ever noticed that the sweetest meal you ever eat is the one you don't deserve? Have you ever noticed that the clothes that fit you the best are the ones that you don't deserve? Have you ever noticed how that life is at its freshest, has the most meaning to it when you don't deserve it? That's when you look up to God and say, thank you, Lord, you're a good God. Because God gets all the glory for it. That's what's important about this. You don't earn it. If you earn, if you got everything, if everything you've got, you've earned, then go strut around like a little banny rooster and take the play and take the glory for it. And I tell you, that's what's killing churches today, because everybody feels like they've earned what God's given them. No, God's been good to me. The fact that I can get up here tonight and stand in front of you and preach the word of God is the grace of God, the good grace of God, where God's been merciful to me. This coming, this coming October, folks, this coming October will be four years. 
Four years ago, I was lying flat on my back with heart failure, congestive heart failure with an ejection fraction of 19 in the hospital. And the cardiologist looked at me as he walked out the door and he looked at me and he said it in a matter of fact, just a, just a matter of fact uh, uh, way, uh, you got a weak heart and walked on out the door. He didn't have to tell me that. I knew it was weak. I was so weak I couldn't even get up out of bed. Now look at me. God's blessed me. God's been good to me. I've been sawing logs, raking yards. I'm going to put me a garden out this year. I, got, I feel like inside I want to do something. For the first time in three years, I got something inside that said, live, <laughs> live. Amen. And I'm trying to do the best I can to preach and drop dead behind the pulpit. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. I got it made. Amen. You couldn't think of a better way to go. Amen. I remember a few years ago, I remember a few years ago, right after I had all this heart problem, and I could tell that I was weak in here, and, I, and when I first got up in the pulpit, you remember, I could only speak a little above a whisper. Didn't have enough wind to do anything. And I got, I got on my knees one night before God, and I said, Lord, either I'm going to preach or die. Which one's it going to be? I'm going to preach or die. I'm in this world to preach. And my strength started coming back to me, and he gave me back that preach. He gave it back. That's my calling. He gave it back to me. And then I got on my knees one time, and I said, Lord, doesn't matter to me. It'd be fine if I leave from behind the pulpit. That's okay. That's okay. I'm going to give it everything I got when I get up there, and I start preaching the Word of God. Amen. And God has blessed me like you wouldn't believe. Amen. I've probably got 80 to 90% of my strength back. And I'll tell you one time, folks, I was weak. I was weak, weak, weak. And God has blessed me. Been Oh, I preacher. Grace. Grace. I don't deserve it. God's been good to me. Hallelujah to God. Amen. Thank him. Thank him. Thank him. You want to be put in that genealogy? Thank God for his goodness. Not because you deserve it, but because he's a good God. Hallelujah. Amen, amen. Then the Bible says in the book of Matthew, chapter number one, of her that had been the husband of Uriah. It doesn't even mention her name, but who was that? Bathsheba. That Hebrew name means daughter of Sheba. Of her that had been the wife of Uriah. Uriah was a Hittite. He was a foreigner. He'd been brought into the congregation of Israel. He was, a, he was an honest man and he was a courageous man. He was on the front lines fighting for the kingdom of David. David was a treacherous devil. David was a murderer. David was an adulterer. Amen. Tell it like it is, friend. That's one, of the, that's one of the sorriest deeds recorded in the whole Bible is what David did to Uriah. He took, he took, he took, he, he brought Uriah in. Uriah wouldn't go along with him to try to cover up David's sin. So he sent him back to the forefront and he sent a letter, a letter saying, put him in the hottest part of the battle and withdraw from him. Yeah. You talk about treachery and they did. And Uriah was a courageous man and they withdrew from him and he died on the battlefield. He died as a, as a courageous warrior. And folks, I say something to you tonight. I don't know how a lot, of folks, a lot of folks don't feel this way, but I do. There are tens of thousands of little of, of mark, grave markers all over this world. Normandy, for example, has, I, th I forget what it is, 10, 15, 20,000 grave markers over there that came from June the 6th, 1944 when our troops hit those beaches in France. And young men, 16, some of the, I read a thing the other day where a 12 year old joined the Navy in World War II. 12 years old, 12, he was a big 12 year old, but he joined the Navy. And, and he joined the Navy and it was a long time before they found out how old he was. And once they found out how old he was, they discharged him with, an, with a dishonorable discharge, which should never have happened. Just kick him out. You don't need to give him a dishonorable discharge. But later on, they gave him his pension. He was 12 years old. You, all you got to do is Google it, and you'll be amazed at how many 15, 16-year-olds fought in World War II. You'd be amazed at how many tens of thousands of kids went off to World War II, and they fought, and they bled, and they died. It was paid for by blood. You must never forget the sacrifice and the courage that was paid for this country to fly that flag. And two of the things about that flag that I hold dear to my soul is my freedom of speech 
the same crowd. Now listen to me. The same crowd that's trying to shut down free speech with these political candidates is the same crowd that will shut us down with so-called hate speech, whatever they want to call it. They'll come after your First Amendment right to preach and teach and, and speak the Word of God. That right was bought and paid for on these battlefields. And here's this crowd of devils running around today trying to take it away from you. And then that Second Amendment to that Constitution, that Second Amendment means that you have a right to bear arms. At 2 o'clock in the morning when somebody kicks your door down, do your prayer and keep your powder dry. Amen. 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 I was born in 1946. The country that I was born in in 1946, the United States of America, is not the same United States of America. And I don't like what they've done to my country. What about you? I don't like it. And maybe this year in the election process, something can be done to change it. I'm up here tonight because of the grace of God. I don't deserve to be up here. I deserve to be in hell. I do. I deserve to be in hell. If a man ever did anything to go to hell, I did everything a man could do to go to hell. But in 1973, God came to me and he saved my soul. And he wrote my name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Some of the great heroes of the Bible are not Israelites. Some of the great heroes of the Bible are people that are brought in to Israel. For example, Caleb. Caleb, the Bible says, was of, mentions the tribe that he belonged to, but if you go back and do a little research into it, you'll find out that he was more than likely a proselyte because it makes reference to a Gentile. And being a proselyte, he was brought into the tribe. But Caleb and Joshua were the only two that said, we can take the land in spite of these giants. They were the only two that stood up and said, if the Lord God said we can have it, we can have it. That's the kind of attitude you've got to have tonight, folks. You've got to have the right attitude. Let me tell you something. I know an awful lot of people that have right theology but wrong attitudes. Amen. You go around dragging around like God's going to smack you dead. God's going to get you the next move you make. Listen, let me tell you a little secret tonight. If God's out to get you, you done been got. <laughs> what makes you think you can run from God? <laughs> if God be for us, who can be against us? I mean, that's a no-brainer, folks. He's not out to get you. He's out to help you. He's out to minister to you. He's out to give you something. He's out to bless you. He's out to change you. And that change, when it takes place, is profound and it's eternal. Oh, he's a good God. He's a good God. Been good to me. And so Joshua and Caleb said, we can take it. And the rest of the spies said, no, we can't. And so God said, okay, if you can't take it, I'll let you die in the wilderness. And for 40 years, they wandered around and they died and they died and they died and they died. But old Joshua and old Caleb lived on. <laughs> and when the day came for them to take the land, Caleb said, I've got one little thing for you there, Joshua. What's that, Caleb? I want that mountain. <laughs> You know what Joshua said? It's yours. <laughs> Just like that. It's your mountain. You can have it. Amen. God's got a mountain for you, friend. He's got something for you. He'll, if you persevere with him, don't, don't let Satan beat you to death and, 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 and condemn you constantly day in and day out. He that offered up his own son, how shall he not freely with him give you all things? If God's out to get you, then none of us got any hope tonight. Amen. 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 Joshua and Caleb. Then here's one of my heroes in the Old Testament. His name is uh, uh, Obed-Edom. Edom, an Edomite is a, you know, he cursed, he, th he, he disdained the promise and blessing of God, Esau. And Esau became the Edomite. And Obed means servant of. What a name. Obed-Edom means servant of Edom or servant of Esau. My goodness gracious, what a thing to call somebody. Here's Esau that despised his birthright, and here's a man who is named, I'm a servant of the one who despised his birthright. You see, Hebrew names are very descriptive, very descriptive. 
When you say David in Hebrew, it means beloved of God. Abraham in Hebrew started from Abram father to Abraham high father. Sarai means princess. These names have meaning. Adam means of the earth, of the red earth. And on it goes. Wonderful names. Wonderful names. Joshua, for example, so closely akin to the Lord Jesus Christ that in the book of Acts, he's called Christ. Jesus, when he went into the land, means Jehovah saves. Jehovah, the covenant-keeping God. But did you know that that ark of the covenant of God had been with the Philistines? They couldn't keep it. They never could keep it. They never will be able to keep it. They don't want to do with it. You let the holy thing move into the midst of a bunch of pagans and they don't know what to do. They get upset and superstitious and they don't know where to turn, what to do, what to say. They have no idea. You let the Holy Ghost start moving in the midst of a bunch of unsaved people. The only, one, the, only, the only thing they know to do is get scared to death and start running. Have you ever watched people who come into this church house right here and watch the Holy Ghost start in a meeting? And I mean, I've got, I know I've got an advantage on you because I'm up here looking down there. You're down there looking up here. So at the best, you might see the side, but I see your face. And I've seen the Holy Spirit begin to move in this congregation. Since some of these women shout, they raise their hand. These people look over there like that. It's like they're a foreigner. It's like they don't have any idea what's going on. And I've seen some of them begin to cringe. I've seen some people come in here. They think, good night. Is this a bunch of just a wild, where am I? An insane asylum? They have no idea because there's nothing in them to relate to the Holy Spirit. Nothing whatsoever. That's what happened when the Ark of the Covenant went into Philistine land. They had nothing to relate to it. But when they brought it back out, the holy, holy, holy instrument that it was, they took it to Beth Shemesh, the house of the sun. That's what it means. Israel, Israelites at Beth Shemesh looked in there and the tens of thousands of them died. Died, died, died because they knew better. God judges you for according to what you know. They sent it to the house of Kirjath Arbim. They sent it to that house, the house there. It stayed in that house, but, but uh, you know what happened with Yuza? Yuza touched it. Yuza died. They called it Perayuza because he touched the ark. And so here is this thing that nobody wants. Would you want it in your house? <laughs> and they put it in the house of Obed-Edom. Servant of Edom. Like Ruth, who made his choice to be with Israel. And you know what happened in the house of Obed-Edom? How many's read it recently? What'd he do? Blessed. No curse and no death, but blessed. Now I'm sure that Obed-Edom paid it the right respect. I'm sure he went over there handling it. I'm sure he wasn't, certainly wasn't looking into it. I'm sure that that thing stayed in a certain place in his house that he never got near it because he respected the power and the holiness of God. And God blessed him. God blessed him. Do you know who touched that ark after it was in the house of Obed-Edom? You know what he did with that ark? Do you know who got a hold of that ark out of the house of Obed-Edom? It was David. Do you know that David is the only man in the Old Testament that was able to do what a priest could do and what a king could do? He was the only man that God allowed to do that. Any other king tried to usurp the office of a priest and God smite him. But David could get away with it. Why? Because he's the type of Christ. And so David brought that Ark of the Covenant out of the house of Obed-Edom. And what did he do with it, preacher? He got before it and he started dancing. And he led it off into a tabernacle that he'd made for it. It wasn't the tabernacle of the wilderness. It was a special tent that he'd pitched. And he had that tent waiting for it. And he brought the Ark of the Covenant into that tabernacle. And there it stayed. But the final place for that Ark was not the tabernacle. It was not a tent. It was a temple. And it wasn't David that built the temple. It was who? Solomon, Solomon his son. Yeah. David wanted to build the temple with all his heart. Yeah. But God said, you've shed war. You've shed blood in war. Therefore, you're not qualified. So Solomon built the temple. And they brought that ark of the covenant into the temple of God. And they brought it in there out of the tent. That was there at Shiloh. They found Shiloh. Yeah. Shiloh is a beautiful, wondrous place. But they finally brought it into the, into the tent, into the temple. And when Solomon brought that Ark of the Covenant into the temple, you begin to see what real holiness is about. He brought it into the temple of God, and the glory of God settled down on that temple, came into the rooms of that temple, and the priest couldn't see their hands before their face. What he was doing is showing them the difference between the creation and the creator. 
that there is glory that is brighter than the physical light of this world. He turned this light out. It's like when the Lord Jesus died on the cross at Calvary. At noon, he turned the lights out. Amen. The only thing you could hear was the Creator. You couldn't see him, but you could hear him. And so that Ark of the Tabernacle, Ark of the Covenant, was placed into the temple of God. It drove the priest out, and they had to go outside because of the glory of God that had come down upon that temple. It was grace, grace, grace. Because of all men that ever lived in that Old Testament, Solomon was one of the worst. He brought child sacrifice, Molech, and all of that into Israel. He was responsible for the death of no untold thousands of little children. They died because of what Solomon did. The kingdom of Israel was never Solomon's kingdom. It was David's kingdom. David is the only king that Israel ever had that united the tribes from the north and from the south. He united the ten northern tribes and the two southern tribes. It was David, not Solomon. When David died, the kingdom began to split and come apart. Solomon could not hold it together. If you'll remember that when Solomon died, that the two northern tri ten northern tribes split away from the two southern tribes because he couldn't hold them together. Their allegiance was to David and not to Solomon. And so when we come to the kingdom of Matthew chapter number 1, verse 1, Solomon's not even mentioned. It's the kingdom of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and David. David is the king. Abraham is the father. And so through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we have the kingdom of David. David has two kingdoms on this earth. Right now, there are two of them. You've got the kingdom of heaven, which can only be ruled by a righteous, sinless man. That kingdom of heaven is not in force right now. That kingdom of heaven is in abeyance. It has been removed for 2,000 years, but you've also got the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom, the spiritual kingdom that can only be entered in one way, by grace. This is why that genealogy in Matthew chapter number one is so important, because David is a king over two kingdoms, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven during the time of David, God gave to him because of grace, because Dave, God said to David, your king, your throne, your, 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 your sovereignty will never depart from this earth. There will never be a time that a man will not be sitting upon the throne of the kingdom of David. David is the king. Therefore, when you mention Israel and you talk about their kings, there's only one king. That's David. None of the rest of them really matter that much. It's David. Israel has one king. That's David. David is the type of one man, the Lord Jesus Christ. David, my friend, is the type of the Son of God. And when the Lord Jesus comes back to this world, he will sit in Jerusalem on the throne of David. And he will reign over this earth. And the 12 tribes of Israel will be gathered together right there in the Holy Land. And according to the book of Ezekiel, every one of them will have their own plot laid out. All the dimensions are in there. It will be laid out for them for the 12 tribes of Israel. The last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, that finishes up the canon of Scripture, finishes up the New Testament. Lo and behold, the 12 tribes of Israel are mentioned. God has not cast away his people which he foreknew. God's not finished with the Jew. That's why I am a premillennialist. That's why tonight I believe that there is a difference between the Jew and the Gentile and the church of God. The Jew, God's not finished with. He's going to come back. And the Bible says they're going to look upon him whom they have pierced. They're going to ask him, where did you get these wounds in your hands? He'll say, in the house of my friends. They'll begin to mourn that day. The Bible said it's one that mourneth for his only son. It'll be when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back personally visibly and physically to appear to Israel, to the Jew, that they are saved. The Lord comes back and then the house of Israel is saved. Romans chapter number 11. All the preaching we do, all the evangelizing we do, it's all good. But we're not going to get Israel saved. It'll take the second coming of Christ, coming back to his own, to his own people. Then when he does, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, puts the Jew as the head of all the nations. He'll sit down in the throne of Jerusalem, there in the throne of David, Matthew chapter number one, verse one. And a king will reign in righteousness. Zechariah called him a righteous branch. There he'll reign in righteousness as the king over the kingdom of heaven and as the king over the kingdom of God. They'll be reunited again. What Adam lost, Christ will restore. There he'll rule and reign from Jerusalem. I'm glad that I'm just part of what's going on. Amen. I don't know what place he's got for me. I don't know where he's going to put me, but wherever it is, thank you, Lord, Amen. that I'm here. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's good enough for me. 
I tell him day after day after day after day, I said, Lord, thank you that I'm a messenger. Thank you that you've chosen me to be a messenger. You've just given me a place and I'm so proud of you and I'm honored to serve you as a messenger. And I'm happy to be a messenger. God doesn't require me to perform miracles. He doesn't ask me to save anybody. He just tells me to preach the word and teach it. And that's what I'm doing. And I'm happy doing it, folks. I'm satisfied. I'm happy. A man couldn't be any happier what he does than what I'm doing. And God's given me the strength to do it. And so I, what I say to you tonight is this, and I'll shut up. I'm up here because of grace. I'm saved because of grace. I'm kept because of grace. I'll appear holy in his presence because of grace. I have a high priest right now at the right hand of the Father who ministers for me in grace. And when he comes again, he'll come and he'll shout my name and I'll come with him. And from that ground will come a glorified body and my soul and my spirit will be united together in the clouds. What a day that'll be. Can't you imagine when the heavens are full of the hundreds of millions of the family of God around the king, the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Father, in thy holy name, thank you, Lord, for that genealogy of grace, Matthew 1, 1. Thank you, Father, for these women who show up there and the men who show up in that genealogy and the reason for that genealogy, Lord, is to make it very clear to us they don't deserve to be there. It's because you want them there that they're included by grace. And I'm thankful tonight, Heavenly Father, that it's by the grace of God that I'm here and that you saved my soul. In Jesus' name we pray. For Jesus' sake we ask it. And amen. Amen.